hypersonic missiles are advertised to travel around Mach 10. And the big panic is about how to defend against them because, or even if we can defend against them, since by the time an inbound missile is detected, it might be too late to do anything at all. Now, a shipboard solution using an active onboard jammer is appealing since the response time can be nearly instantaneous. And there's no need to throw anything overboard, so there's no, there are no resupply issues with an active onboard jammer. And jumping to the punchline of this video, cross-polarization jamming is a good candidate. And I will make a case for that based on what I know, my experience, the laws of physics, the laws of electromagnetics, and although I can't talk about it, things I have observed as trials director during certain experimental tests. So here are four ideas to keep in mind about hypersonic missiles. First point, the speed of a Mach 10 missile depends on what altitude the, the missile speed is quoted at. I mean, a Mach number, that's a German word, is the ratio of an object's speed to the speed of sound. And sound travels more slowly as altitude increases, so a Mach 10 at high altitude is slower than Mach 10 at sea level. A sea level uh, at sea level, it's about uh, three and a half kilometers a second. So if the missile is detected at 35 kilometers from the ship, which is pretty far for, for example, a high subsonic missile, you've got about 10 seconds until the missile arrives one way or the other, and much less than 10 seconds to destroy the missile or cause an unrecoverable heading error by jamming it. Point two, interpret specifications carefully. A missile advertised to travel at Mach 10 does not necessarily travel at that speed through its entire flight. That's important in order to correctly calculate a realistic defensive reaction time, for example, for a ship target. Now there is a Wikipedia page for the Chinese DF-21 hypersonic missile which supports this conclusion and suggests a terminal phase speed of about Mach 2, which is plenty fast, but it's a fifth of the speed of the 100-foot tall statement that the DF-21 is a Mach 10 missile. So at the very end of a hypersonic missile's flight, it might actually be a supersonic missile, and we have countermeasures for supersonic missiles. So the countermeasure for a hypersonic missile might be the same as for a supersonic missile, and I will argue shortly that a missile that's in a big hurry to get to the party unintentionally acquires an important vulnerability to cross-pole jamming. Okay, point three. Skin heating is important. The skin of a Mach 10 missile gets majorly hot. Uh, above Mach 5, a plasma sheath forms around the front of the missile. The word plasma means it's a state of matter where the electrons don't belong to single atoms anymore, so the air behaves like a super hot metal skin around the missile. And if the missile is intended to hit, a, for example, an aircraft carrier or any target which, which could have moved since the missile was launched, then the missile needs a seeker to actually find the ship or find the target when it gets close. But an RF seeker can't see through plasma, and neither can an IR seeker. And there are problems if we tried to use, for example, a video camera that uses AI to pick out a target. This implies that when a hypersonic missile gets close, it has to its target, it has to slow down to below Mach 5 to shed its plasma envelope in order for the seeker to find and track the target. And even so, I expect the reaction time would would be between, let's say, 15 and 45 seconds, so not long. Now, three soft kill options come to mind. The first option is soft kill option is to use chaff, and a chaff is a cloud of hair-like metal wires dispersed by an exploding rocket. And the idea is to either distract the missile or hide the target behind a metal curtain, effectively, that reflects the seeker's radar signals. But these are tricky propositions at best. Chaff takes time to bloom, it follows the wind, and it doesn't reflect radio waves like a real target. And I would expect a sophisticated missile to have a, a chaff discriminator um, and in any way eventually run out of chaff rounds, so there's, there's a resupply issue. Soft kill option two is to use an offboard decoy, but it takes time to launch a decoy and get it into position and then to pull the missile away. Plus, an intelligent seeker can be expected to distinguish a decoy from a real target, and I made a video about that. Alternatively, a surface or airborne drone could carry a beacon payload and remain on station waiting for an attack, but that also has complications. The third soft-kill option is to use an active onboard jammer. Now, a jammer has the advantage of, a, let's say, a nearly instantaneous reaction time, uh, but it has to provide both range and angle deception. And here's a link to a video I made about the evolution of countermeasures and the interaction of angle and range uh, deception. 
Now, there aren't many options for creating angle deception against a modern seeker without throwing something overboard, but one of them that does work is cross-polarization jamming or cross-pull jamming. Here's an engaged simulation of a supersonic missile attack. The idea behind onboard angle deception jamming is to create a phantom ship, like a ghost ship, as far as the missile is concerned, that is located somewhere over the open ocean where there is no target of any kind. Yes, it works, and yes, it can be controlled. And I made a bunch of videos about cross-pole jamming, but let's examine the situation for a supersonic or a hypersonic missile. So here's a picture of the seeker of the, I think it's a Russian KH-31 supersonic missile. So it's probably traveling around Mach 2.5 or 2.4. Now this is an old fella from I think the 1980s, but it is relevant. An in-service seeker and autopilot that work are so difficult to and expensive to create from scratch that a proven design might find use in hypersonic missile that slows down to supersonic speed in its, during its terminal run-in. The seeker looks mechanically robust, probably because it has to withstand high G launch and severe buffeting during flight. The feed arrangement resembles the MG-13 fire control radar from the F-101 Voodoo aircraft. Here's an example of the feed we can look at. The feed tip has flanges and there's a septum that makes the feed look like four rear-facing monopulse horns fed by half-height waveguides. Let's take a look at the seeker antenna from the point of view of susceptibility to cross-pole jamming. The feed stem looks like a stationary post to me, so the antenna must be a mirror scan design which the Russians have used before. For example, the SSN-2 Styx missile. This means the feed stays stationary and the beam is pointed, the antenna beam is pointed by moving only the reflector in azimuth and elevation. The reflector acts like a mirror, so that scans the beam. And uh, rods are used to move the uh, reflector and we can see two of them in the photo. Here's how the mirror scan antenna works using a flashlight to represent the feed and an actual mirror to represent the reflector. And here's how a rear fed reflector works where the feed and the mirror move as a single unit. And just to hit it one more time, here's how the KH-31 antenna doesn't work. It does not work like this. So is this antenna design especially susceptible to cross-pole jamming? Well, since the feed tip does not move when the reflector is scanned, moving the reflector means that the antenna's symmetry is broken because the feed is no longer at the reflector focus. My initial guess was that this will affect the relative cross-polar gain. So I used the antenna design assist in Engage to look at this for a mirror scan model without the fixed feed stem, so it's not quite the right model. But if the prediction is correct, then my guess is wrong. The mirror scan antenna does not have a higher cross-polar gain. It's about the same as the rear-fed reflector. The symmetry of the antenna is broken, but not in a way that significantly affects the cross-polar illumination of the reflector. The difference between a mirror scan antenna and a rear-fed reflector, from a cross-pole point of view, is that in the mirror scan case, there is very slight movement of the reflector relative to the feed. And of course, for the rear-fed reflector, there is no movement of all of the reflector relative to the feed because the feed and the reflector are scanned as a single solid unit. Now that said, the radome will increase the antenna's cross-polar gain, so let's take a look at that. And the pointier the shape, the more polarization bending it causes, and the higher the dielectric constant of the radome material, the more polarization bending there is. This video is continued in part two.